right. So going back to the early days uh, in the hobby, um, I opened a book, still got the book to this day, and I saw a female epistogrammer, nice and I, um, in, a, in a photograph, and I absolutely fell in love with that fish. Um, and it set me on a long, long journey with epistogrammers, uh, meeting amazing people all over the world, leading out to Brazil to go and actually fish for epistogrammers and, and snorkel with them and uh, actually go into the Rio Negro and go searching for epistogrammers. I've kept and bred about 130 species. Uh, I've got breeding records of all those uh, epistogrammers, and there's a lot of uh, very useful information I can most of the share. Um, so, yeah, so the early days of keeping epistos was um, going to my local shops. I was still relatively young then. Go to the local shops, see what I could find, and I kept and bred over the years so it took me a while because they're not the most commonly kept fish in the world and uh, they're not the most common fish to find especially in general pet shops mm. so it took me a while but we i searched out for epistogramma cacatoides borelli uh, agazizi um, uh, re- uh, an unusual one from asia called steel blue came up mm-hmm. early on which is known to be a bit of a hybrid or could potentially be a hybrid and um, and then after keeping and breeding these fish and I, I absolutely fell in love with them and we'll go over it we'll go into some detail on how to keep them uh, very shortly but i kept all the ones that were easily available to me but i kept reading more and more about these uh, there was hundreds of species and there was new ones being found all the time and oh i was just obsessed and uh, mm. that led me down a big rabbit hole um, of having to look further afield and um, by this stage i was a member of several fish clubs including the british cichlid association um, which then led me to the guys that were really specializing in epistogrammers and i then went on a journey and uh, visiting people the other side of the country and uh, mm. staying in their fish rooms, coming home with bags of uh, fry of very rare and unusual species. And then it snowballed from there. We were in touch with people who went out to collect epistogrammers and bring them back. Some of the rarest fish in the hobby, epistogramma wise. And um, yeah, so over the course of most probably about 10, 15 years, then I specialized in epistogramma. So for those who are listening that don't know about epistogrammas, and I can't blame you, they're uh, a relatively small, obscure uh, genus of dwarf cichlid. They come from South America and can be found across Peru, Colombia, Venezuela, Brazil into Uruguay and some of the cooler southern parts of the countries. And they are very, very small, generally only grow into about two, two and a half inches maximum and right at the bottom of the food chain so that you'll generally find them in the wild in small jungle creeks, heavy leaf litter on the bottom, some wood, and they're cave-spawning dwarf cichlids. So... um, they're generally harem spawners, so they'll uh, they'll take the male will defend the larger area, and within that area, he'll keep several females in there, and he'll breed with all females. The females then take on the brood care, so the female will trap herself into a. Uh, I used to use half a coconut uh, with a tiny notch cut out, soft sand substrate, and I'd set the tanks up maybe with some leaf litter, and. Um, the fish would live in there. They, they absolutely require soft and acidic water and a very good diet of live foods. So uh, they don't do very well in hard water and uh, they certainly don't do very well in uh, dry foods as well. Uh, sex in them, in general terms, there's so many of them, but the general easiest way to sex them is the males are usually far more beautiful, uh, more exquisite finage with long fin extensions, uh, more colour in the body, usually lots of iridescent blues and yellows. Uh, the females, quite plain, very often with a rounded caudal fin. 
uh, which is the tail fin for anybody listening who doesn't know what the caudal fin is. So a rounded tail fin and the, the surefire way of sex in them is the black ventral fins. So the two fins that hang down underneath in females, they're usually jet black um, and the body of the female, uh, the body of the females, usually a greyish color, but in brood care, she changes to a stunning yellow coloration. Absolutely exquisite when they uh, go into brood care and uh, fascinating spawners. So that the male will uh, chase the female around the tank. Um, it she'll it, they'll be they'll display. They'll go side on and they, they shake. They've got their own courtship rituals. The female will then choose her spawning site which is usually in a cave or in a tucked away uh, hollow in the wood or under a leaf, usually somewhere uh, hidden away, and she'll get in there. She'll lay the eggs. The male will then fertilise them, but then he'll be chased away by the female, and he will then cease to have any kind of brood care responsibilities. The female will take over the brood care. She'll stay in uh, with the cave, in, with the eggs. She'll stay in hovering fanning the eggs and the most magical time for my fish room was always in the morning generally uh, the female would bring out the batch of free swimming fry as soon as they're ready to uh, find a little bit of baby brine shrimp or some micro worms that we'd give them first food and um, they were out and on the sand substrate usually at the front of the tank and that was always a very very special time for me uh, to get to observe that behaviour, absolutely fascinating. Mm-hmm. So. Um, you said the um, harem breeders in the wild. Does that apply to in the aquarium as well, or one to one pairs, or one to two a better ratio? How, how does that work in the aquarium if you're looking to spawn them? That is a brilliant question. Um, it depends on the tank size, really. So, um, I used to use two foot. They'd be two foot by 13 inches deep front to back and then only 10 inches high because they need a lot of uh, surface area on the substrate, but not necessarily a lot of height. Um, in a tank that size and maybe slightly smaller, I would generally just use a single pair. Um, the best tanks I've ever had were a metre long uh, by at least 18 inches front to back. And... In there, I'd keep a group of them, maybe two or three males. So you can see that interaction between the dominant males and how they form uh, their own territories within that larger tank. And then several females for each male and lots of caves and hiding places. For me, that was by far the best way to keep them. Um, Most of mine were kept in pairs, so I didn't see the full range of activity and and general behaviour in a lot of the species. But, um, yeah, the few tanks that I have kept, uh, the few species I've kept in groups in larger tanks, if I was going to do it again, I think definitely uh, that would be the way forward. They don't have to be very tall. Um, like I said, they don't use a lot of height. They will come up in the water, but generally they want to be along the substrate and close to the bottom. Cool. And a question from Rochelle again. Uh, which epistogram are ideal for beginner, I believe, a beginner epistogramma keepers who are relatively experienced in fish keeping, but not in epistogrammas? Yep. Rochelle, you would do great, absolutely great with epistogramma Borelli. Very forgiving, one of the more peaceful epistos, so you're not going to run into too many issues with uh, hyper aggression with either the male or the female. They're relatively chilled out. Uh, so, Epistogram and Borelli, they come from um, Uruguay, so uh, they, they can be kept at much cooler temperatures mm-hmm. as well. Um, so, anywhere really around the 22 to 25 degree mark would would suit them well. Um, Epistogramma cacatoides, which is now commercially bred into several varieties and easy to find generally. Um, so, yeah, Epistogramma cacatoides would be a second perfect introduction to uh, Epistogrammas. But sadly, um, you need to find a shop that can actually stock them or will get them in for you. So actually finding the fish in the first place is quite often half the battle. Um, 
but also half the fun because you get to visit a lot of fish shops, <laughs> which is which is great for all of us. We surely uh, we we all do that. We all love going around fish shops, and uh, like I said, for me, the fun at the end of. Uh, the actual breeding was actually them finding the next projects and and the next the next special fish. 